Good morning uh, and welcome to ABC Chat. Uh, my name is Rich Taught. I'm part of the team here at Glidescope Health and Care. Um, if you've joined us for ABC Chat before, uh, a very, a very warm welcome back. Thanks so much for uh, coming back to us every Thursday at 11. Uh, if you've stumbled across ABC Chat for the first time, well, welcome in. Uh, and I think you've stumbled across uh, what is going to be a fantastic episode this week. Thanks so much for joining us. If, if you have just stumbled in and you're wondering what on earth this thing is, uh, well, <laughs> let me explain. ABC Chat. ABC stands for Apart But Connected. Uh, we live in some pretty funny times at the moment, uh, some pretty difficult circumstances when the need for connection has never been greater, although the logistical difficulties of physically getting together uh, have never been uh, sort of harder. So how do we continue to connect, to come together, to share, uh, to learn uh, at a time of There we go, hopefully I've just popped back up. Uh, ABC Chat is all about coming together so that we can learn and share together. Uh, thank you so much for joining with us. Uh, every week we have a special guest, uh, this week being no exception. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Sarah Hughes of the Centre for Mental Health. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Pleased to be here. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, how is lockdown treating you? You know, it's OK. I think uh, there are good and bad days, but uh, we're quite lucky. We have a garden. You know, we've got resources and, and things that we can do. So, you know, we're, we're coping OK. But there are times when, uh, yeah, it's trickier than others. But generally, on the whole, we, we're coping OK. Lovely. So thank you so much. And uh, is it right you're joining us from the bottom of your garden today? I am. This is my she shed um, that uh, was built specifically for these moments. Uh, of you know where I need privacy and calm and quiet so this is where I spend my days now. Uh, lovely great well it, it looks like you're in some some beautiful splendid isolation there uh, Sarah. Uh, we look forward to seeing if uh, any flora and fauna decides to come in we've just fought a wasp did you manage to get rid of yes, the wasp? Yes I got rid of the wasp we can't have that it's a bit yeah I mean we've got a bee's nest somewhere in this garden so um, I, I'm, I'm gonna keep those out for sure. Uh, lovely. So if you've joined ABC Chat for, for connection and learning, uh, great. If, if, you're, if you've joined ABC Chat to see whether Sarah Hughes is going to get stung by a bee, uh, well, 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 we'll see as we go through <laughs> an element of peril to introduce into ABC Chat. Uh, Sarah, thanks so much for joining and we'll be hearing from you as we go through. Uh, just to say, uh, this is a show in two hearts. We're streaming live uh, via YouTube, uh, but also we'd love for you to join in and be part of the discussion over Twitter. A uh, whole host of ways uh, which you can do that. We'll be throwing uh, questions at you uh, through today's episode, so please do uh, respond to those when they come through. Uh, but also some, some rules, they're not really rules, guidelines perhaps, mild prompts uh, about using Twitter just to connect to those who you might not otherwise have connected with. So please do share your reflections, reply to others, like their Twitter, even maybe uh, send them uh, a DM. Please do use it as an opportunity to reach out. Uh, and thanks once more for all of you joining. Uh, we are going to throw questions at you as we go through. Uh, and our first question, as always, is a, is a really tricky one, uh, where simply we ask you uh, who you are, and where you're, uh, where you're coming from. Uh, that might be a, a professional location, a, uh, a room in your house location. It might be that, like Sarah, you're at the bottom of your garden, uh, hiding away from, from family members. Uh, wherever it is, uh, let us know who you are and where you're from, hashtag ABC chat. Uh, as always, if you want to accompany that, with a uh, quick uh, selfie so we can see where you are please do uh, but again uh, bonus points abc chat bonus points still working on the distribution mechanism yes we know uh, if you manage to include a ridiculous drinking receptacle in that picture uh, sarah do you have a some sort of ridiculous mug some sort of ridiculous receptacle at hand well it's not ridiculous completely but it is my uh, grandmother's mug and this is about um, 25, 30 years old, this mug. And uh, it says herself on it. And in Irish families, you'll often find uh, the parents calling themselves himself or herself. So I have got this one. And one of my brothers, I think, has got the other one. But I also have a leopard print flask 
to so that I'm going to be hydrated throughout. There's never going to be a problem. Uh, lovely, Sarah. Thank you very much indeed. Can we just confirm the leopard print flask? Is that a, is that a leathery feel or a metal feel or no? It's metal. It, you know, it can hold hot and cold drinks. <gasps> so you know, I won't tell you where I got it from, but you know, major supermarket brand. Uh, a major supermarket brand. Other major supermarket brands are available. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. Uh, today, what am I going with today? Today I am going for the ridiculous espresso mug, which I suppose if I hold it like this, I can pretend it's some sort of normal mug. But no, it's it's a tiny, tiny little bird thing. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed, Sarah. Thank you for all those sharing uh, on uh, Twitter. I uh, do hope to see some ridiculous drinking receptacles as we go through. Uh, very warm welcome. Thank you all so much for joining. We will we'll move on, please, uh, to our first section, which is just a chance to look back. Times are changing pretty quickly, and it's really important just to give yourself a bit of space to reflect on what you've learned, uh, and particularly of what you know now, which you didn't know last week. Sarah, what have, what have you learned over the last week? Well, you know, there's been, you know, learning seems to be really amplified right now. You know, things that we thought we knew, um, we don't quite know as much about. Um, just on a personal note, and no, I'm, I'm learning to try and reduce the amount of time that I'm spending online because, uh, you know, I'm zoomed out of my mind. Uh, I, you know, zooming for, you know, eight, 10 hours a day, there's only so much of that you can do. So I'm uh, forcing myself take some time out of, of Zoom, which is, which, is a, which is really difficult because, you know, there's so much going on. Uh, but I'm making myself have one day between Monday and Friday where I don't have any online conversations, which is working a treat when it happens. Uh, lovely. So thank you very much indeed. I'm sure that uh, that Zoomed out uh, fatigue uh, isn't one restricted to you by, no. by any means. Uh, and so is, is it working? You mentioned to hold the, the barriers of having those uh, Zoom free days. Uh. Yeah, I mean, you know, I work in an organisation where we can have these conversations about how we support each other to stay well during this time. So we've got all sorts of well-being things that happen in our organisation. And, and one of them is supporting each other to take time out. Uh, so I'm very lucky that, you know, any time that I've said, I just can't, I can't have another discussion today um you know i've got a great team who say no problem we'll we'll sort it out so that's fine uh so thank you very much indeed and i think that so last week we talked a bit about uh commuting and sort of how sort of commuting sort of some stuff you do when you're commuting or traveling to meetings you can always have the excuse of if there's a meeting far away saying oh, i'm really sorry i'd love to come to your meeting i just <laughs> I can't physically get there it's less of an excuse you can use for a zoom meeting so it's so really important uh to put in place those those boundaries. Um, well, what I've learned this week, um, I think I've learned that having a bank holiday on a Friday is really just, well, not disturbing, let's not go that quite that far, but certainly discombobulating. I don't know about anyone else, but I spent all of this week thinking it's the day ahead. So I, I think today is Thursday. I sort of presume it is because we're doing ABC chat, uh, but Monday certainly felt like Tuesday. Uh, and so I wonder if actually discombobulation, that slight sort of feeling of what on earth is going on today, might be the feeling of, of COVID. Others might be experiencing mm -hmm. that. Uh, and certainly amplified uh, when we have uh, sort of uh, slight changes to our to working weeks. So just to be clear, I'm not against bank holidays. Bank holidays, I'm very much in favour of. Bank holidays on random days um, certainly have thrown me somewhat. Uh, so what have you learned this week? Uh, thanks for those sharing on Twitter. Please do continue to do so. You said, Mike, Sarah might be a uh, struggling with continual online fatigue. If you are struggling with online fatigue and you've still made time to join us on ABC chat, <laughs> thank you very much. There's a certain irony there, uh, but thank you for doing so. We will move on. Uh, and our next section, uh, as previous uh, viewers will know, uh, we call Jack and Ori. Uh, Jack and Ori, um, uh, olden days TV show, uh, children's TV show, for those uh, uh, old enough to remember, uh, all about storytelling. Uh, this isn't a show with glossy presentations. What we want to do is to hear stories, stories which have resonance with today's times, but are not directly about them. Uh, I'm delighted that we've got Sarah here today. Uh, Sarah, what story are you going to be sharing with us today? Well, I'm, I'm going to be talking about why public health is important at the moment um, during this pandemic and 
for the future as we recover from what has been quite an extraordinary time for us all. And um, I am old enough to remember Dakinori uh, really vividly. So I, I um, yeah, I'm that old. Um, but I, I think there is something that I want to share today, which is when I think about um, public health, I think about my own experience just um, throughout my life. And I've, I've been somebody who has really benefited from social mobility levers. Um, and my family, for instance, have traveled from all over the world to land in the UK, both in Glasgow and in London. And so I'm, I'm uh, you know, have heritage for, for, for people who've worked really hard to settle in the UK, but they came from very deep poverty and certainly didn't have the experiences or the opportunities that I've had in my life to, um, you know, move from poverty to, to a thriving life experience, if you like. So, uh, you know, I was brought up a Catholic, so I went to a really good grammar school in North London. I had free university education, I, I know, uh, extraordinary. Um, so that was that was in the early 90s, so a very long time ago. And I, um, whatever life has thrown at me in terms of trauma or difficult experiences, I've had the support of a loving family, extended family, you know, Irish families particularly are huge. Um, and, you know, so have not really um, struggled in the way that I see some of my uh, friends and, you know, people that I, I know from childhood. So, you know, things are, um, I think, quite clear that social mobility offers people an opportunity to um, access things that they may never have been able to access before. And I align all of those levers with a kind of public mental health approach. At the moment, it's very clear in the UK that we have a, a significant problem around health inequalities particularly, and you don't really need to be an academic or a genius to really understand how it's impacting on uh, those people who are the most vulnerable, so people with long-term conditions, people living um, or, uh, you know, on welfare benefits, people in poor housing, children, young people. And so I think that the greatest chance that we have of making sure that the damage from this experience doesn't uh, ruin lives completely or, or certainly doesn't um, take us into just an ongoing survival mechanism is that we really embed prevention approaches in everything we do. And that includes things like, um, you know, how do how do people operate and function on welfare state system as it is not very well so if we could just imagine for a minute if we could really tackle poverty in the uk which is a prevention agenda the impact on so many people would be so significant it would be better for everybody so it, it feels to me that we've got a great amount of good quality evidence that tells us about what uh, makes the difference to people, good housing, um, a good enough income, a way of dealing with difficult life events. So certainly we would say post this pandemic, we would want to see trauma and psychologically informed environments in schools, workplaces, communities, in families. Um, all of us will have experienced probably one of the biggest shocks um, in our lives in terms of uh, the pandemic. You know, our uh, lives have been turned upside down. And for some people, certainly in my family, we have lost people from the virus. And all of those things uh, will have an impact for a very, very long time. But we know what the impacts could be. We also know what some of the things we can do to avoid enduring damage. So uh, the economic shock, for example, you know, we know from the 2008 recession that uh, suicide increased, mental illness absolutely was exa exacerbated across society. And we know that we're stepping into another one. Therefore, um, prevention uh, approaches would tell you that we really need to mitigate the damage of the economic shock. Now the government at the moment is doing some of that, the furlough scheme and others absolutely do contribute to that. 
but we're also talking about people who uh, aren't in those circumstances, who have lost their jobs and so on. We're also talking about children going back to school. Uh, how are we going to manage that? How are we going to think about um, how they re-engage, how they reform their relationships with their friends. You know, my children, for instance, have been isolated since the 10th of March. They went to school one day and uh, they came home from school and we told them, you're not going to, you're not, you know, you're not going to school tomorrow. That's a massive shock. Um, and there are millions of children around the country having to deal with that. And some children will not be in a situation where, um, the emotional responses will be well understood or thought about. So I think, you know, the problems are really complex and, you know, I could, I could talk about this for a very, very long time. But since 2015, public health have had £1 billion um, stripped from the public health budget. And I'm not going to get political about it, but um, that one million, one billion pounds needs to be replaced and some to face the consequences of this pandemic. Um, when, when you know, and it's not actually just to clarify, we're not talking about post pandemic. We're talking about now, uh, the investment into trauma informed and psychologically informed environments needs to happen today. Sarah, I could rant. You. I could go on a rant, but I won't. Rich. So thank you very much. Well, this is a 30 minute show. We could turn it into a, well, how, how long do you need, Sarah? 30 uh, days. No, no, no. Days? Go on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we could do a marathon chat, maybe. Uh, this turns into the world's longest running uh, YouTube <laughs> show, uh, Sarah Hughes uh, and, uh, and Prevention and Inequality. Um, I, I think probably a lot of people would tune in. Uh, Sarah, thank you very much indeed. Uh, one of the drawbacks to this format is that if we were all together, we would all stand and uh, give you a round of applause. We still can do so from afar. So Sarah, thank mm -hmm. you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, and a really important uh, set of messages there at any time. Uh, but particularly in today's circumstance. Uh, so uh, the chance for everyone to join uh, to get involved. Uh, what we'd like to, you to do, please, is uh, send in your questions. Again, please use uh, Twitter, hashtag is ABC chat. Uh, and what we'd like you to do is use uh, the particular circumstances to our advantage. Uh, so to use the, the safety of your laptop. Uh, to send us questions which you may not otherwise uh, ask in person. Uh, they could include, for example, free university education. Free, is that a thing? Is that a thing? It was a thing. When was it? Hang on. When not? I know. It's a, you know, how times change. Uh, but what, what one question would you like to ask from the safety of your laptop, which you may not otherwise ask in person? Uh, so much there to uh, so much there to reflect on, um, uh, and so I'll, I'll I'll take chairs progress if that's okay, and just uh, kick us off whilst other questions come through. Uh, and so, so just I, I can imagine a lot of people nodding along, and I think it's it's a time when we're all talking about sort of public health and need for prevention more than we ever have done so before. Whether that's about why we didn't buy more. PPE or I didn't invest in sort of more uh, sort of uh, surveillance systems beforehand. How, how confident are you that this focus on prevention will, will survive when we return to whatever form of, of normal we get back to? Will we still care about prevention or will we just slip back into old ways? Well, you know, I think that's a really important question. And, and I think that um, certainly what the pandemic has uh, afforded everybody is seeing things in a way that they would never have seen before. So certainly the overrepresentation of deaths from black and minority ethnic communities, we can't unknow that, we can't unsee it. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping and, you know, often spend my, my um, nights before, you know, trying to get to sleep, you know, worrying about this very issue. Um, this is a tipping point. If we can't see it now, then I, I don't really know what will uh, help us make sense of it. So if the government don't see the importance of, of public health in terms of both infection control, but also in relation to thriving communities, um, this situation has revealed itself in a way that I, I think the case is incredibly compelling. I think we also have to bring the public along with us. And, and there's something about, 
you know, moving from the evidence is really robust in public health. We've got some extraordinary people around the country, Lisa McNally and Jim McManus, particularly public health directors who are just next level in terms of their ability to understand what their communities want. Um, but we also need to get the public really understand what public health means. I think we all get the prevention is better than cure uh, dynamic. But actually, this is really understanding what public health is there to do, how it can help communities, how it can really empower people to make their own decisions, how it can provide evidence about what will really make the biggest impact on a particular dilemma or problem. So I think we've got a challenge. I'm an optimistic person, so I believe that, that we can nail this. But it is going to require a cross-sector, um, cross-society buy-in. And uh, organisations like mine and yours, um, it is our duty to make sure we bring the evidence to the table, but we also tell the story. And, and I think that's what we're trying to do today, but, um, you know, every day for our work. So thank you very much. Really, really important message. Questions coming through, but very much sort of picking up on this theme, firstly. Uh, Corinne, thank you so much for joining. Corinne, uh, so sort of saying, so how can we, uh, how, how can we help leaders use their data to make evidence-based decisions? You say you say, there's all of this evidence which absolutely predates COVID. How can we actually help people use it? So that's one. And then Theo, thank you for joining Theo, to saying, so you talked about poverty. What would be top of your uh, sort of policy change wish list, Sarah? In terms of other areas to to sort of lead to this uh, uh, sort of proper public health approach to mental health. Nice easy um, question for a couple of minute response. No, it's not, but it's something that we think about all the time. So there is a whole big list, but I'll just go for a couple. The, the first thing is, I think, um, to tackle poverty in this country, we need to think about our welfare system. We need a radical shift. Uh, we would definitely want to see a commitment from the government to think about universal income uh, ways of operating so that people aren't, um, you know, in universal credit terms, living hand to mouth quite literally. Uh, we don't, we, we absolutely don't accept that the system is working in a way, in, in a way that, sh that it should. I think we would ask the government to consider the New Zealand model for a health and wellbeing budget. Um, that we start to see our performance as a, as a country, not on our GDP, but on our health and wellbeing, you know, goals and, and outcomes, that those things become the most important, um, you know, things that we want to get to. Uh, I think we also want to see something about race equality. Uh, you know, I, I think we talk a lot about race equality. I think this pandemic has shown that decision makers, policy makers haven't, haven't heard it. And I, I don't, I don't, I can talk about why, but I'm not going to today. But I think that really for me is something that uh, would change the face of the way this country oper operates for the better. And I, I can't often understand why we, we're not tackling it. It makes no sense to me. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, sort of questions continue to come through. I'll keep my glasses on this time. <laughs> Oh, you're doing really well. Uh, a really nice observation from Sam. Thanks for joining Sam saying uh, sort of shares your uh, sense Sarah, that the pandemic will have a long term impact on mental health, particularly through economic pressures. Risk is that that economic recovery moves faster for those best protected. Uh, so, for example, the, the indecent haste to revive the property market. So, uh, again, so how can we make sure that this response is aware of those inequalities, uh, whether that's sort of uh, race equalities you talk about, uh, or social inequalities, or, or the other inequalities which we know run through our society? So, um, I think there's layers really. Um, from our organisation at the Centre for Mental Health, we translate data. Um, you know, we try and make sure that the that data is used in a way that various stakeholders can understand, government, decision makers, providers of services, but also, you know, the general population. So we can really help people understand actually what's going on. I don't think sending out figures really helps people. People need support in making sense of them. But I think we, you know, we don't use the, the term lobbying 
Um, but effectively, quite a lot of what me and you know my organisation does and our partner organisations do is heavily lobby um, decision makers around these issues. So we convey the evidence um, and we try and, and, and collate information in a way that makes sense. I think the most important thing we can do going forward, and this is something about allyship really, which is uh, as organizations, we should be allies and advocates for the people that are deeply affected by social uh, inequality. And therefore make sure that the people who it affects have the platform to tell their story and to share the impact on their lives. So very often you, you can find yourself as an organisation speaking for communities um, very easily um, and, and, and sometimes that's, that's appropriate. But I wonder whether we need to do something a bit more brave and that means giving up some of our power, literally stepping aside and letting those people who it affects come forward and really share their own experiences. And I think all of that is probably quite important going forward. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, a, a lovely, uh, uh, challenging note for us, we're going to have to move on, but a challenging note for us to, to finish on in terms of actually sort of those organisations who most want to see change, how do they need to change themselves in order to, in order to get there? Uh, mm -hmm. So this is a conversation which could run and run. Uh, if people want to follow up with you on Twitter, is that okay? Oh, absolutely. Very welcome. Excellent. And oodles of information on the Centre for Mental Health, Mental Health website, I imagine. Oh yes, oh my gosh, I, I must say that because um, my comms team will absolutely annihilate me if I don't mention it. Our website has virus um, information about the virus, but it also has lots of information about the work we do generally. Um, we are publishing a very important report tomorrow, which uh, Rich, you should uh, get a copy of in probably about an hour or so, if you haven't already from Andy, but it's about uh, forecasting what we think the real impact on mental health will be. This is a, um, the first in a series of three um, pieces that we're um, publishing over this time. So do look out for it. I mean, it doesn't make for entirely pleasant reading, but it, it's important. Um, uh, critically important. Sarah, thank you very much. Uh, and we are out of time for questions now, and we're questions still coming through. Thank you for those. Uh, but we will we'll move on. Thank you, everyone, for uh, the discussion. Thank you, Sarah, for responding so eloquently. We'll move to our, our final section now, which is all about uh, a moment to give thanks. We're all finding in our lives new ways to give thanks to those who are doing such uh, sterling work, such sterling contributions to, to our lives and others. Uh, at this at this difficult time. Uh, so a question to uh, you, everyone joining, in terms of who would you like to give a standing ovation to this week? It might sound close to you, it might be a group of people who you particularly want to tip your hat to. It's an organisation which we at Glyscope will particularly reference in a moment. But Sarah, who would you like to give a standing ovation to this week? Well, because I never stick to the rules, I've got two people. And the first person um, is my mum. And during this time, uh, you know, my mum actually only lives across the road, but um, because she's a cook in a care home, uh, we can't we can't see her. We can drop food at the door, but but we can't do more than that. And um, it means she lives on her own because my father died. Um, and it, it's really, I, I think, quite tricky to not see your family for quite a long time. She's got three children, all of which who adore her. She's got grandchildren who adore her. And all that me and my brothers want to do is kind of, we're all much bigger than her. Um, it's just kind of grab her and, and lift her up and give her a big squeeze. She's doing a great job. I'm going to touch wood in her care home because of the extraordinary work that has been done there. They've had no cases of the virus. And um, I just want to send a shout out to, to her and to their team, They're extraordinary people. And just finally, one last person is um, my colleague, Andy Bell, who everybody knows in mental health. Um, you know, he's been doing some extraordinary work behind the scenes the last few weeks, particularly around helping people with mental illness access the NHS volunteering scheme and so many other things. He does it with such humility and grace. Um, I'd really like to give him some thanks. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. Uh, and and to, to incredibly worthy candidates for standing ovations. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank you for those sharing on Twitter who they'd like to give a standing ovation to. Uh, our standing ovation as Glasgow 
this week uh, goes to another organisation local to us, uh, Bead House, uh, based in Southwark, not far away at all, uh, working since 1938 uh, to bring together uh, different parts of the community uh, and deliver some really important services to uh, on, on causes which are incredibly important at any time, but again, particularly so at this moment, including learning disabilities, youth work, domestic violence and, and beyond. Uh, so Bead House would like to give you a standing ovation. I would like to give Sarah's mum and Andy Bell and everyone else who uh, sort of, I want to give thanks, all of them a standing ovation too as well. Please, we'll give them a standing ovation. Thank you very much. Uh, lovely, thank you. Uh, and sticking on the theme of Bead House, as people have joined before will know, uh, there will be an evaluation form following today. We'd love your, love your data, please. Uh, so that we can improve what we do uh, for each of those evaluation forms filled out. We will donate three pounds, at least three pounds, uh, to Bead House. So if you uh, have an aversion to filling in forms, uh, hopefully you don't have an aversion to giving money to good causes. Uh, so that form, uh, we will tweet out the link uh, on Twitter, but also we'll just pop it in the YouTube details as well below the video. Uh, so please do, if you can find a moment to fill that in, we'd very much appreciate it. I uh, will be back next week, uh, 11 o'clock Thursday, uh, so we hope to see you then. But thank you so much all for joining. Thank you so much, Sarah, uh, for leading such a thoughtful discussion today. Uh, if, if we could see uh, everyone watching, I'm sure there'll be lots of nodding uh, and uh, uh, absolutely agreeing with everything you were saying. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. There'll be a short blog summarising what we've been discussing later on today, so watch out for that. Uh, so from all of us here, we'll say thanks very much again. Uh, and we'll see you next time on ABC Chat. <laughs>